Well, hey everyone, hopefully we're streaming here. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to catch up, so I really don't ever know if it's actually going anywhere or if it's not working, but I think it is working this time. So we're going to go for that, and hopefully we get some people here to call in and start uh, asking some questions soon. But hey, look who I got with us. We have Epic Math Time. Uh, this is my friend Jonathan. I've known him quite some time on Facebook. He decided to throw his hat into the ring and make a YouTube channel about That's math. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if people haven't noted, uh, met you before, you know, tell them who you are and, and why, you, why you decided to do such a thing. Yeah, okay. So my name is John. I'm, I'm a PhD student studying math. And, you, you know, I never really thought I would like teaching so much. But once I started teaching with my assistantship, I really liked it. And I used to be in the graphic design a long time ago. So the YouTube channel was just a, an amazing combination of a lot of my interests because it has math, it has teaching. I do graphic design and, you know, bring my way of explaining things to life in a way you can't do in the classroom. So I, I love it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It feels good when people say, hey, you know, I watched one of your videos and I actually learned something. I, I only did a handful of math videos. I, I yes. didn't get to the level. Obviously it it, math it feels have. amazing. I like it, though. It, 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 it is great when somebody says, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that before. And now that you explained it, it's not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Those are the greatest things I can actually get. Right. Right. Or just just ex even if they really are really familiar with the concept, just explaining it to them in a way that they've never thought about it before that use. And everyone has their own, you know, unique way of, of thinking about these things and seeing these things. And everyone's different perspective is like extremely valuable to me. I, I think so. I think so. Um, like for example, I, I had a hard time with math struggling when I was a kid, right? It wasn't until I actually went to new school. I went, Oh man, I, I really got to learn this. And I buckled down and I forced myself to, and had I have the, the preliminaries prior to that, I think new school would have been a lot easier for me. Uh, mm -hmm. because if you don't have the foundations for mathematics, it's one of those things that is precept upon precept. And if you don't have the fundamentals down, as you get to the higher levels, those discrepancies in your base level education, I think are more notable. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, there's definitely a lot of catch up that gets involved. If you, if you come back into it without those foundational things for sure. But I think the, the biggest thing that holds people back is, um, it's really a decision you have to make to, uh, by the way, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be seeing you right now, but I just see the nun smoking. Yeah. You're, uh, um, I tell you what, you want to see what they're seeing. You can watch the video with us. You just have to turn the volume down, but I will send it to All you. Right, never mind. So that's you fine. can see what we're seeing. Uh, I'm talking to a nun, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's because the <laughs> hang out of music is from the nun. Okay. Uh, crap. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. right. So I think what holds people back a lot in math is a psychological, like mental block. Like my students will all, all, all the time, they'll say, oh, well, I can't do that. I, I'm not good at that. Just it's a decision you have to make. Like anyone can do it. You know, human beings, we are all, or, you know, generally speaking, we are capable of logical reasoning. That's what makes us human beings. And all mathematics is, is a big logical game. So, yeah, if you know the rules, that's the hardest part is like, what rule do I use for this? Like, I watched your video on, as a matter of fact, we'll ask the question now before we get into some of the stuff. But I have on the screen here, uh, over here in the middle, uh, a very famous uh, identity that uh, was derived from a very famous formula. Uh, if you can tell me the name of the person who came up with that formula. Uh, yeah, I can probably butcher well, the pronunciation. It's Leonard, Leonard, Leonard Euler. Yeah, I was asking the audience, but that's okay. See, I already knew that you knew because I watched your video. All right. So it was Euler. Yes, as Euler, pronounced Euler. Um, but let's see if they can actually tell us what formula that's from. Um, but you had a video on this, deriving it using Diffie Q, which I thought was pretty interesting. I never thought yeah. about it that way. Yeah, I haven't seen it done that way. But what's so great about that identity is that those those constants that are involved in it, or they, they seemingly come from completely different concepts. Like you have E, the base of the natural logarithm and the base of exponentiation. And then you have pi, the ratio of a circle's diameter and circumference. And then you have I, the imaginary unit. So these, these things have nothing to do with one another, it seems like. And then they interact in this way that, you know, e to the I times pi is negative one. And it, that's so strange to me. Like these, these numbers that have nothing to do with one another and then they combine in that way. So that's why that identity is so famous, I think. Because it's just like, whoa, I, 
it's just out of nowhere that they interact that way, you know? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I think it's my favorite as well because it literally has five of the most fundamental um, constants out there. I mean, where do you go from E, I, Pi, 1, 0? Those are five yeah. universal constants that would be the same anywhere in the universe um, for all practical yeah. purposes. I mean, you could have a system without zero, but, uh, you know, if, if uh, advanced civilization had mathematics, they're going to know what these constants are, I would imagine. Right, right. That is true, yeah. It might be expressed completely differently, but, no, you're right. E is... is it's it's a fundamental constant that will appear, you know, any any in any you know alien civilization that thinks about these things will come to the same conclusions. That's true. Yeah, there's 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 actually things in physics very similar called natural units that uh, that would all civilizations, no matter where, would find it eventually. Planck length, Planck time, um, right, g. Right, yes. There's just certain things, speed of light, that are just constants that. It would be the same to any observer from any point mm -hmm. in the in the universe. So that, I think that's kind of cool. But yeah. uh, all right, let's dive into this real quick. So one of the first things I want to talk about before people start calling in is this has been rearing its ugly head again. The whole nasty nine yards of 0 .9, re 9 repeating equals 1. I have explained it multiple different ways. I have multiple videos on this. I have shown people how to do it via calculus, via uh, geometric progression, via simple algebra, and just basic common sense. I've got into details involving, you know, like uh, the fact that the reals are dense. There's no rational numbers between two any uh, reals. But if, 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 if there's any number between two reals, then the reals are not equal, basically. So x plus y over 2. I've explained that uh, there are no... Uh, infinitesimals in the reals, right? Because of the Archimedes principle. So I've done this whole gamut, and yet I still, after all these years, have a few people that just for some strange reason insist that I'm wrong about this. Um, one in particular got so bad that I actually had to end up blocking him because he was degrading my intelligence and those of my friends who have actual PhDs and PhD students. And I wasn't appreciative of that because he had no expertise in this area, no education in this area, never read a math book. And clearly, you know yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> so, I mean, there's a point where you have to go look at, um, if you if you're not familiar with the topics, then you're not going to be able to really do much to convince an expert that they're wrong. I think you have to familiarize yourself with the topic in order to do that. Now you are an expert in this in your own right. So what 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 is about this particular thing that you think? I mean, have you had one? Have you had students actually not been able to figure this out and not be able to grasp it? Or uh, I mean, I know you've seen it, but what do you what do you do in those situations? Well. So the only time I've ever brought this up, I've never brought this up to my students or anything like that. You know, it's never come up. But here's the here's the thing to remember. 0 0.9 repeating is a symbol. It is just a symbol. And if we want to talk about what that symbol represents, we have to agree on what it's representing. Right. You can't just say that that symbol has an innate meaning and argue that your meaning is correct. It's just a symbol. And that symbol means the limit of a certain series, you know, uh, 0.9 plus 0.09 plus 0.009. It's the limit of that, that series, and that limit is 1. And so that number, that symbol, 0 0.9 repeating, is a number, and it means 1. It's that simple. Now, if you want the symbol to mean something different, <laughs> okay, that's fine. You can do that. But the... the the normal way we interpret decimals makes that number equal to one. If you want that, we, you talked about the Archimedean, Archimedean property. If you want that number, that symbol, 0 0.9 repeating, to represent a number that is infinitely close to one, but not one and less than one, then that number is not a real number that you're talking about. You can, there's nothing wrong with having an idea of such a number, but it's not a real number and you are using decimal notation in a different way than it's always used elsewhere you're just changing the meaning of the symbol yeah so that's the best way to really put it it's a symbol not liking the, that symbol representing something that they intuitively think that symbol should represent yeah well they, they look at that symbol and they think it's some kind of ongoing progression right they think it's 0.99 and they think it's some progression towards something right they don't yes. recognize that that symbol is a tr is a finite value it is a summation of a series or limit of a sequence depending on what you if it's 0 0.9 uh, 0 0.9 0 0.09 0 0.09 that'd be a series but 0 0.9 0 0.99 0 0.99 that'd be a sequence but there are limits to these things when you're working with summations and, and sequences so 
what they're not recognizing is when they see 0.99 repeating, that is the final completed value. That is what it converged upon, which if, you, if, a, if a limit of a sequence converges to a number, then that number is the limit of the sequence, which in this case is one. So that has to be equal, even by mathematical definitions, without even getting into the proofs. I mean, this is one of the I, I think about math that I like. Sometimes you don't even have to prove anything. You just go by mathematical definition. They're the same. And in this case, I could actually make an argument that 0.9 and repeating is equal to one by definition, by, by mathematical definitions. Yeah, absolutely. And that's 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 the fact by definition of how we read decimals and that's why every proof for it works because if you just use the normal rules of arithmetic and algebra and everything they comply with the definitions that's why they are what they are that's why all the proofs work every every proof, proof is gonna go back to and rely on how things are defined but yeah i have heard people say it gets closer and closer to one and like it's not going anywhere it's it's a number it's either one or it isn't it is, of course, but, but it's not going anywhere, you know? Yeah, well, this got brought up the other day because one of my friends, Red, said 1.99 repeating equals 2. And I, I, of course, was like, yes. But I had a few people go, and that's not true. Um, so this, the people that are watching now, um, many of them actually do watch the non-sequitur show, so they know what I'm talking about. Uh, you can go back now and tell that person, whoever it was, because I don't remember who it was, that they were incorrect, 1.99 repeating is equal to 2 because 0.99 repeating equals 1 and 1 plus 1 equals 2. 0.99 repeating times 2 is 2. Yeah, of course. So every every single decimal number that terminates can be repeat um, represented this way. Like if we have 2.3, that's 2.29 repeating. We have 3.1415, that's 3.14149 repeating. You know, you can do that with any number. Any of them, yeah. I mean... I, Euler himself proved 9.99 repeating equals 10 in one of his mathematical books. I just don't remember which one it was. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was a really small proof. It was just basically using uh, the algebraic version. Um, right. Yeah. But, I mean, he did actually do it. So, I mean, if it was good enough for Euler, it's good enough for a schmuck Yeah. I mean, the way, we, the, the way we use decimal notation requires that 0.9 repeating be one. It has no other reasonable meaning. And every proof is going to, every rule of arithmetic is going to agree with that. It's just the way it is. It's just a symbol, and it means one. All it's, right. So I think I think that that has been played out. Um, I don't know where else to go with it because anybody who just says that it's not, um, unless they can actually write a paper and show mathematicians that they're wrong. And by the way, there are constructivist views where you can actually get around this if you're a finitist. Um, while our uh, N.J. Wildberger has stuff like that. Oh yeah. yeah but I don't. Stumbled. Not a fan. You're not either. Um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, he's obviously, he obviously knows what he's talking sure, about. Sure, sure. Like, um, but I mean, at that point, that's just accepting a different axiomatic system. What I don't like is, is that he, he claims that the reals are like not well defined, but that their, their, their definition is just fine. But I actually have a funny story about how I learned about him. So I was looking for a lecture on YouTube about something called covering spaces. It's a topological thing. And, uh, I uh, came up to his to a lecture by Wildberger, and um, and I was watching it. I didn't know anything about him. I was watching it, and he, I noticed he kept using. So, so let me ask you this, okay? If I, if I asked you for an example of a three-dimensional vector space, or you know anyone, they would probably say R three, the real numbers with three coordinates. Mm -hmm. R R three is 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 three-dimensional space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just the real like. Uh, <laughs> So any three points in space can define. Yeah, yeah, three yeah. real numbers. Right. Yeah, I remember three that. Points, three real numbers. Well, in those situations, he kept using Q, the rationals, over and over again. So like, okay, first, so I'm like, okay, that's pretty strange. You know, most people would just say R, but he's using Q everywhere. So I thought that was odd. And then I kind of got led down a rabbit hole when I looked at the comments, and uh, someone's like, "Why are you using the rationals for everything when normal people would use the reals here?" And, you know, he didn't respond, but some other people respond, responded saying, like, he didn't uh, agree with the foundations of uh, real numbers. He doesn't, so, he, doesn't accept the rational, he doesn't accept the rational numbers. The rationals? Yeah, he doesn't accept the irrational set. He is a finitist. Oh, irrationals. Yeah. Okay. Irrationals. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we might have somebody who wants to talk to you. We might have a caller here. So. Okay. All right, so let's uh, fix this so we can get you on here and not somebody else. All right, who do we got here? Well, I'm fixing this. Because every time I get a caller, I'm going to have to change this a little bit. 
one one six one nine three area code or six one three area code. Who? What do we got? Hello. Hope it's not an X. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Can Can you hear us? Uh, this isn't working for him. I don't think. Hello. Okay, well, I guess it ain't gonna work for him. It was worth a shot for him. Hello. Hello. Oh. There we go. Now, yes, you got a, you got a question for uh, John? I, I think he is. I'm sorry. What? Did you have a question? Yeah, I guess not. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, man. You're gonna have to like come back when your phone works. So. All right. Anybody else want to give it a shot? I know we got a people in the audience there listening in, so call or join either way. Yeah, doesn't really matter. Uh, either way, I just gotta resize these things. Which when I'm doing the outside field, I'm actually resizing you because every time somebody comes in, I gotta <laughs> re redo the setting because this doesn't have like this NDI channels where people can like call in with a specific feed uh, from their webcam like we have on non sequitur, unfortunately. All right, let, well, let's uh, let's look at the um, live chat. Uh, live chat, anybody has questions out there, ask a mathematician. You've got one here. Um, if you want, in real time, he's gonna, he'll be able to solve the Riemann hypothesis for you. Uh, I, think he's, uh, I think he's finished uh, P equals NP, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. I think he's, he's, he's solved also Fermat's last conjecture. And uh, what's the one? Uh, what's the one? Four-color theorem? Uh, no, is that that one's actually been well, done? I think. Yeah, that was that was that was that one's done. Yeah, that was done. Okay, never mind. It was done by you though, right? No, I'm afraid not. Mm. <laughs> is the guest familiar with Project Euler archives? No, don't know what that is. No, Fermat's last theorem was already solved. Was it? Was Fermat? Yeah. Solved? Okay. Yeah, uh, 1994, I believe. But it wasn't by Fermat. Didn't Fermat? Didn't he write something no, in the? he's dead. He's yeah, been, but didn't he write something in the in the in his notations that he had a solution to it? But it never. Yes. Yeah. He, okay. he he mentioned that he had a beautiful proof for it, but so I actually talked about this in my last video. Um, he uh, the the proof that we have from '94 uses areas of mathematics that were not <laughs> developed yet in Fermat's time. So like, you know, I'm kind of skeptical whether or not he had an actual proof. And if he did, it's certainly nothing like the proof we have today. Yeah, it wasn't that for like the Pointier conjecture. Um, he had the guy that, uh, that Israeli guy or whatever, he had to uh, actually come up with a whole new type of mathematics and use Ricci flow and... Yeah, yeah, he used something called the Ricci flow and um, which was developed by other people. And um, yeah, I think his whole his whole deal was that he, he believed that his contribution wasn't necessarily greater than theirs because he used he built on the work of others. So his name was uh Perelman. Perelman. Yeah. Wasn't it Perlman? Yeah, yeah. Perlman. All right, caller. Does your phone work now? Hello? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's going. What do you got for us? What's your question? I, I've heard before that some people use math to predict the future, and I've always been curious to know how that was done. What was that? He said, he said uh, his question is, he's heard math could be used to predict the future. <laughs> so, you know, if you have a completely deterministic system, and if the world is deterministic, which we know it's really not, so <laughs> depends what you mean by predict, too. Does predict mean 100% accuracy? If so, no. But the idea of a deterministic system is that if you know all of your your all of the properties of some system at a certain point in time, then you know all of the properties about the system at any point in time because nothing's up to random chance or anything like that. Everything follows strict laws and equations. But you know, there's there's good reason to believe our universe isn't deterministic. So See, I think I think it's I think it's I'm a soft deterministic. I think there is reasons to think that it's deterministic in some ways. It's not fatalistic. But I think in some ways it's deterministic. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can predict the future. Uh, there are things that uh, that uh, can influence that. I mean, we have we have agency. But if it was a completely one hundred percent deterministic situation, then yeah, you would kind of be able to predict it. Um, but at that point, 
what what are you really predicting anything because if there's no if there's no possibility it could be any other way if it's strictly let's say 100 percent deterministic i don't think you're really predicting anything it's like you're just showing yeah. this influences yeah. that that influences that you're showing your right. causal relationship is what you're doing yeah but that's not really much of a prediction if you know that it, if you believe that there are things that have to be a causal chain like i don't think that there are causal changes for changes for certain things i think that the principle of sufficient reason isn't really applicable in, in like physics but Anyways, look who else joined us here. Was, oh, by the way, did I answer your question there, Mr. Area Code 613? Yep, that was pretty cool. Thank you, sir. I was just always wondering, because I have a friend that always says that uh, we have no choice. I think it's already predetermined. No, I don't think we're predetermined. And I don't think, John, you don't think they're predetermined, right? No, it seems like on the, on the, on the small scale of things, you know, the universe seems to be probabilistic. And on the larger scale, it seems approximately deterministic. But there's always that underlying you know, particle physics type quantum scale that prevents it from being fully deterministic. And I can make rough predictions. Like I, I can predict that, you know, the sun will eventually burn out, right? That's a safe prediction. Yeah. You know, those are rough predictions, right? Anyways, uh, Nick, we have Nick, famous philosopher. <clears throat> Semi-known, right? Reasonably known. <laughs> Nick, can you hear us? Uh, well, maybe you have, can you hear me? Yes. I got a little delay. Are you watch? Are you listening uh, to the, uh, so, the feed or? Well, this is actually really bizarre. I don't have audio. Or, I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you on my phone. The, um, the yeah, you get it. You're you're listening to the actual phone, video. Working on the headset, the, so I yeah. can hear you on the phone. Well, <laughs> but I think we're going to need to fix that because that's not tenable in the long term. I do yeah. have two two questions. I wanted to know a bit more about. I'd always thought of things as as completely deterministic with the exception of uh, when you get into the quantum realm. But even then I'm, I'm curious. And then I had another uh, question long uh, uh, about uh, if N is the set of all sets that do not include themselves. This was a problem that I think had been around for a long time, eventually got solved. And I was curious about, about the solution to that. So maybe you can, Answer those questions. What was the first while question? I I, I, the second was the Barber paradox, obviously Russell's paradox. What was the first one? Did, did you catch the first one, John? Yeah, it was okay. The, go ahead. The deterministic thing. So uh, you said he's curious about uh, well, what's that? Nick, you're li you're listening to the you're listening to the the feed vice the um, the hangout here. You you got a four second delay or so. All right, I'm going to mute you in the internal. So you yeah, so my audio is a little bit delayed, and I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah, it's a delay, so it's going to it's untenable for a conversation. Yeah, I'll mute you until uh, and let you listen. Okay, so first, well, wasn't really a question, more of a comment, but yeah, it's completely possible that at the quantum scale, maybe, maybe it is deterministic, and we just can't predict the results well. So we have a probabilistic model. But I think if it is probabilistic at that scale, then the macroscopic scale, it may approach, you know, a deterministic system, but that underlying quantum state is still influencing everything in a probabilistic way. And as for, um, as for the set of all sets that don't contain themselves or, so it was solved in the sense that we, we, we banned <laughs> that idea of a set. So there are axioms that, like mathematical objects are always defined through axioms. And the axioms that define a set are called the ZFC axioms. And one of them is called the axiom of regularity, which says that no set is an element of itself. So it basically imposes a restriction on the definition of what a set is, so that what you describe when you pose that question is not a set. So it's really a cop-out solution. They basically dis disallowed it any longer. Yeah. yeah, and the people yeah. that listen are not familiar with this particular paradox. What it basically when it was like this: if you have a set of all things, does that set contain itself? Because if it's a set of contains a set that contains all things, it would have to contain itself. And one of the ways it's expressed is through a, a barber antidote, where it goes: um, the barber of the town only shaves men who do not shave themselves. Right. So does the barber shave himself? So does the barber shave himself? Well, there's a paradox there. Um, right. But yeah, so so it's a different. So the, the solution, I guess, you were saying is in ZFC theory, you just you just don't take one of the axioms. Yeah, the solution is that the ZFC axioms that define a set do not that that the 
object described in the paradox fails to meet the definition of a set. Hmm. That's the well, solution. I mean, I guess that's one way of resolving it. I mean, if you're going to do it, might as well do it axiomatically. I mean, I thought, I thought, I, I, I like. There's something else that resolves it um, using. Uh, I think it was second order logic, and uh, there's another way to resolve it. I thought using, um, well, no, that's Liar's paradox. But Liar's, Liar's paradox, you know, this statement is false. Uh, Ozzy was telling me how he resolves it using speech act theory, and it's very, very interesting, actually. Well, I mean, in some sense, I think there's, there's, there may not be a resolution to <laughs> grammatical paradoxes. You know, that could just, it, as long as it's not describing something that actually. I, I guess I, I'm just saying that it's possible to form self-contradictory statements, and that maybe they don't need to be resolved. Yeah, I think I think because like when you have a grammatical thing like liar's paradox, I think one of the best ways to solve it makes sense to me it would be grammatically, which is be speech act theory, and that would you know. So I don't know what that is, but um, it, it's worth pointing out that you know Russell's paradox is basically just that same paradox with extra steps. It's just a longer description of the same kind of paradox you know well there you the go barber shaves himself and he doesn't shave himself so 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 you would say that he shaves himself no i would say, say he doesn't shave himself i would say that as form this description must be incorrect because it leads to a paradox so so who shaves the barber then who shaves the barber it could be either way, but we have to. Uh, what I'm saying is you have that to pick if, one. If you, I don't have to pick one. If you, if someone comes up to me and says the barber shaves everyone in town who doesn't shave themselves, you you could say your description is inaccurate because it uh, leads to a paradox. Gotcha. That's what I'm saying. Cop out. This is math. Yeah, yeah, cop yeah. out. <laughs> I admit that. <laughs> no, it's fair. No, it's fair. Um, all right. What else we got uh, from the live chat here? By the way, it is it is Saturday. Wasn't expecting a big turnout for Ask a Mathematician. It's one of those things people have to like. All right, we got somebody. All right, what you got for us, Mister Seven Two Zero? All right, I just want to ask his opinion on whether the four color theorem counts as a proof. Basically, I just kind of want to know: Does he think that a proof is just taking the necessary steps to prove that a mathematical statement is true, or do we kind of have to understand why? Oh, because it was it was a um, very computer involved proof, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the four color was done by. Yeah, computer. there were. Yeah, there were initially about four thousand specific, uh, basically subcases. They ended up being able to boil it down to about seven hundred, but that's still too many to like say to yourself, "Oh, I understand why this is the case." Right. That's true. That's true. So. That's a good question. Yeah, I, we've actually talk, talked about this question with, with Dr. Trailer about what constitutes a proof because that's the very reason. Yeah. I would say it counts as a proof, but it it may have less innate value to us. Like, So another example of that is um, called the classification of finite simple groups, which I think is all handwritten, but it's, it's such a huge proof. And there's so many different parts to it that I don't think any one person could grasp the whole proof in their lifetimes, but they've been ind individually checked. And, um, you know, at, at the moment it's confirmed as being an accepted proof, but proofs like the four color theorem and the um, classification of finite simple groups definitely have less innate value to a person's understanding of a concept. And, you know, Proofs like that would come up often in like number theory when I was studying it. It would, it would claim the existence of some number that does something in some statement. And the proof in the textbook would just be, okay, here's the, here's the um, algorithm for the number we're describing. And then they show that their algorithm works. But there's no insight to how that's even constructed in the first place. So it's just, it gives you the claimed existing number and it confirms that it's what we wanted. And, and that's that. And <laughs> so it's better was, than we leave it to the reader to prove. What was that? It's better than when they say something like we yeah, leave it to the reader to prove. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, left as exercise for the reader. Exactly. I, I feel like that's what Fermat was really going for when he said, I have a proof for this, but it's way too long to put here. You got, Sorry. Yeah, you figure it out later. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, there's, a line, there's a line in Euclid's Elements that almost directly translates from Greek to left as an exercise for the reader. 
That's amazing. That's awesome. All right. Thank you. You guys have a good one. Yeah, no, but I think there's definitely something to be said there about what constitutes approved. Now, I, I, obviously, I, I think it is approved, but I do think that there's something elegant about a, an a actual analytical, mathematical, formal proof, right? Yeah, but yeah. unfortunately, the proofs have gotten to the point where, you know, unless you understand the way these things are written, they're just going to be a bunch of gibberish. You, you mean, I, I, I can't understand this stuff, right? I mean, I, 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 if you do me, a, if you show me a simple proof, you know, if I, I look at something like you did for Euler's identity here that I have on the screen, uh, use differential equations, I can understand that. But you go mm-hmm. past that, and it's going to be very confusing to people. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got somebody else asking a question. Go for it, Mister Six One Four Area Code. No sound. Yeah, we can't hear you. All right, well, we're waiting for them. Uh, Go ahead. Is that okay, I'm sorry, did you say 614? Yeah, that's you. Uh, good afternoon, Steve. I have a silly question. I'm not very good in high mathematics at all. I grew up in a small town, didn't get very well educated in that area. So my question is, what do you think is the biggest mental thing that you have to take on board in order to get good at calculus. I know, Steve, you did some training for a while. I don't know uh, uh, if Matt Time did, but what is it that makes it so that you can learn calculus? Drugs and coffee. Okay. Nic- oh, nicotine yeah. and coffee. I would say that when it comes to calculus, so the way mathematics progresses in general is, is we start looking at more complex things as the like little game piece so like you start off learning arithmetic so you start off learning about numbers and you know adding and subtracting and whatnot so if you go ask the child what they think hard math is like they're gonna say oh it's big numbers but they're just taking that that one thing that they already know about and extending it so the key to learning calculus is to realize that you're no longer talking about numbers anymore you're talking about functions and those are the fundamental creatures that we're talking about in calculus we don't we we don't do arithmetic with numbers we don't care so much about that we want to know what's the derivative of this function what is the extreme of this function what is the integral of this function so the function is like the fundamental game piece that we're talking about so there's a there's a needed mental shift to see that the function is the, the the game piece that we're playing with now that makes sense. Yeah, no, that that I, I, makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're right because when you start getting into higher maths, you're really dealing with functions a lot, um, and I think a lot of people have a hard time shifting their mindset. They're so used to you know right. simple um, arithmetic that when they start having to think in terms of functions and polynomials and uh, yeah, you know, basic calculus, that's where they start getting confused because they don't think of it conceptually as such and, and this is right and when you move on to like abstract algebra you're thinking about rings you're not you you know rings have things inside them that have arithmetic but you you, you don't you don't you aren't so um concerned with the things inside the ring you're looking at the, the whole ring as a whole that's the structure that we're studying and in calculus we're studying the function so yeah <laughs> all right well thank you yeah, and if you ever really get bored, check into r- reading about rings, fields, and um, um, oh, what are those groups. things called? Well, there's rings, fields, group, but there's one other. Um, uh, it starts with an M. Oh, monoids? Monoids. monoids. Yeah. So yeah. Those All are, right, thanks for the show, guys. No problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Monoids, or, um, monoids are almost groups. They fail to quite big groups. Yeah, well, all that stuff just lost upon me. I mean, I get the general gist of it, but this is why I don't become a mathematician because I'd be like, yeah, this is too myopic even for me. I like I like the concepts, but I'm like, wow, when you start getting to those dis, dis nitpicky di- details, what, what constitutes a group, what constitutes a, uh, uh, a field, what constitutes uh, uh, whatever the hell, uh, what are the monads. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very confusing, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the naming isn't so important. Like, I only know, I only remember which, actually, I think a monoid is a group that fails to have inverses, but. Uh, it doesn't have an inverse it's identity? Not right. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just so, it's just a term. You well, know see, like, I, mean? I understand that. Like, I, I mean, I understand, like, um, there's something called the, the, um, oh, I'm gonna, hey, I'm going to butcher this, but it's called the zero element, I believe. And it's where you have one equals zero where one is the multiplicative additive and zero is the additive additive, uh, additive identity. So sure. one is the multiplicative so that, that's identity. A, that's in a structure that has two operations. 
Yeah, so, so you see, one equals one. zero, even though you're not dealing with actual numbers, you're dealing with identities in well, this. If, if you say one equals zero, then this that structure is going to collapse. It's only going to have that one element. That can't happen in a ring. Well, um, it ha the the one equals zero is a very special type of ring thing. Uh, zero the, comma zero ring. The zero ring, yeah. yeah. It, it, that's what I meant, it collapses. Because you can show by the distributive property that in any arbitrary ring, zero times any element is zero. But the <laughs> multiplicative identity, one, has the property that one times anything is going to be that thing. So wh whenever you basically apply the, the ring axioms to one and zero claiming that they're equal the whole ring collapses to just a zero ring a ring with one element yeah exactly yeah wow i mean this is this is why people are going why 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 are we learning about math it's fun no it really is i mean i i gotta admit i i i at least like reading about this stuff very so often because it's kind of like you know it's challenging it's challenging to learn something new um, and I think that everybody should have a basic grasp of a lot of this stuff. I mean, yeah. at least to the point where they understand like Euler's identity, right? I think that's such a beautiful, elegant equation that I think everybody should kind of know what it is and how it's derived from um, Euler's formula. By the way, I'm not sure anybody else got that in the live chat, but props if you did. Um, but I think the uh, formula itself, if I remember, uh, e to the i pi plus cosine i plus i sine i? Uh, e to the i, e to the i theta. Theta, it, e to the i theta. Yeah. Cosine theta plus i sine theta. theta. Yeah. So e. So, but you, you're going to be if it's e to the i theta plus cosine theta plus i sine theta. You can change theta to pi, and then work your way through it, and then you end up with this. Yeah. You end up with That's i right. e to the i pi equals negative one, and you just move the negative one over, and there you get e to the i pi yeah. plus one equals zero. Yeah, that's right. All right. So, what are the questions we got? I mean, here's your here's your chance to ask all those things that you you were afraid to ask in your in your cow class because you didn't want the teacher to go, God, you're, you're never going to pass this class. I didn't do that well in cow in, in college. I mean, I, I did okay, but I mean, um, and this was after nuke school. And the reason why I didn't do well in, in I mean, I did okay, but uh, one of the years in most years I had straight A's, but cow actually brought me down a little bit one semester. It was because that they were teaching analytical calculus and I had learned more graphical calculus so that the type of, of uh, Leibniz notation they used I wasn't aware of and mm. so it presented me a challenge by almost having to relearn everything over again in some ways but all right Nicholas you want to try again Steve somebody says Steve went to college yes I went to college I just didn't complete but I have more than enough credits for a bachelor's degree I know that's hard to believe but yeah I, I almost in theory I have the equivalency of a bachelor's degree in nuclear technologies I just didn't complete the, I have like 120 plus semester hours, which is more than enough uh, for a degree and bachelor's degree, at least where I'm at. Oh, here's a question for you. Do you prefer two pi or tau? Uh, pi or tau? Two pi is tau. Yeah. So like, which do um, you prefer though? Oh my God. Okay. So. I like this question actually. Yeah, it's good. So it's hard for me to admit this, but okay, I, 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 I am partial to pi just because I'm like, I'm used to it. But from what I've seen, tau is superior in pretty much every way. Right? Right? Yeah. I agree with you. Tau, tau it, makes it, it sense. Seems like, it seems to be the choice we should have made. Yeah, yeah. If, if you go back does, and change things, right? It does seem to be the correct or canonical <laughs> constant that we should use. I'll admit that. Yeah, I, I definitely think tau is easier to use, and it just makes sense rather than having to work through, you know, pi, uh, one half, yeah, it's, two it's pi, better. two thirds pi. I don't know. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> Nick, you back with us? I think so. Can awesome. you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, well, no, I, I and I have an extensive, and I mean extensive, background in mathematics. I'm really just coming in to make sure that everybody here is 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 really. You know, and it looks like it looks like you got it. Yeah, covered. I, I read I read your master's oh, thesis on integral uh, calculus as a as a as a three body diagram um, that you, you solved and resolved. Um, amazing work. Um, I mean, how how you 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 did some of those integrands? I am just amazed. Well, th I think. Yeah. Well, no, look, you know, I had a little I had a little spare time, and I figured, you know, that must took you like t at least at least five minutes. Well, okay, I, I appreciate it. it really did take me about a half hour or so okay. but you know um uh you know it's it's i figured i'm sure if you saw john's work you'd be like holy crap <laughs> no i wouldn't actually i wouldn't I'd be like is any of this english what is was this... your master's on john uh i haven't picked a thesis topic yet so it's probably going to be on a uh, some form of abstract algebra though it's something like 
Fair enough. Yeah, my least favorite stuff is abstract algebra. Cause it's, really? It's abstracting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, well, I mean, I, I find it difficult. I mean, you're not going to front. I mean, abstract out lie groups and all that stuff, I don't get. I never have understood them. I never will understand them. I don't lie groups? Lie groups? Yeah. What are they? That's lie, hard. lie groups. That's hard. That's hard stuff. Yeah. Lie, I said I can't pronounce it. Lie groups. Is that what they are? Yeah, Lee groups. Yeah, that's 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 complex. That's like, I wouldn't expect an undergraduate that learned about group theory to see Lee groups. Yeah, I I well, I try to look into everything, right? I just yeah, some things good. are just I but recognize to be that's, beyond my capability at the moment. That would be off putting. That's that's up there. Yeah, because sure. I well, I was trying to figure out using there's something in physics called supersymmetry and symmetry theories, which uses gauge theory, um, SU three, SU two, SU zero. There's different types of super these uh, these gauge theories out there, and I was trying to wrap my head around them, and I, I can't do it. And I took matrix a little bit. I understand a little bit of matrix. I don't understand gauge theory at all. Um, but one of these days, maybe if you master it, you can come in and explain it to us. I don't really know what gauge theory is. I'd have to look that up. It's complicated. It is bizarre. It is, um, yeah. I, I don't. Is I don't even have to really. Math dis topic. What? Is it a math topic or a? Physics it's more topic? physics. Oh, okay. More physics. Yeah. I, I I don't know what it is. Can you give us like the the? Uh, yeah. It, well, basically, it runs like this. If you have a certain amount of particles, like in the protons, we have down and up quarks right so uh, two up one down two down one up for a neutron and proton so there's certain things that we have to expect certain particles to be um we, ha we expect certain uh what's called intermediate vector bosons to exist for force carriers for example for the weak interactions we have zero we, i mean assuming the w zero we have z we have other intermediate bosons that are the, those force carriers so we expect to find using symmetry um and gauge theory Gravitons for gravity. So gravitons would be the force carrier for the force gravity, right? Gluons would be the force carrier for strong nuclear force. So there's a, a unity of all these different particles that we, we would predict we have to have some particle that will take care of this force. And in, in supersymmetry, it just gets bizarre of a whole slew of, of hundreds and thousands of particles, it seems. Um, but I don't understand how the, the math works or why it has to be like that because it's based upon these matrices that are very, very complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I went and kind of Googled it. I saw, the, I saw the, uh, that they're invariant or transformations from, from Lee groups. I think the way to think about that is that, um, so I did a video on representation theory. Basically, the idea is that for any, any kind of finite group, we can think we can it can be represented as a certain group of matrices and matrices represent uh, linear transformations in a vector space. So the idea is that any group can be thought of as a set of those linear transformations. That's why in my video about representation theory, I said that any finite group is um, expressing the symmetries of something, which is a really bizarre thing because if you take this, you know, this arbitrary, crazy finite group, you know, representation theory is saying that that group is describing the symmetries of something. So maybe you've seen that the moves of a Rubik's cube form a group. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that group that describes the moves of a Rubik's cube is describing a 20th dimensional shape. So, so it has yeah. a faithful representation into a 20 dimensional vector space. So it's describing. That's, this insane. That's insane. That's yeah. A, that's a lot of different, different yeah. permutations and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, so now, what is your, um, what do you think is sort of the most fascinating thing about mathematics? What, what, what do you find most interesting about it? Ooh, that's a, that's a hard question. I think it's just the fact that that the truths of mathematics kind of send to, they, 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 they transcend like the physical world. Like the truths of mathematics are kind of independent of a physical reality in a certain sense because they're they're just based on logical constructs that exist simply because they can be described and they make sense but they may not have they, they basically I, I guess it's see it, it points to the idea that the, behind the universe there's like a software and math is like the software behind it if that makes sense um, that makes a lot of sense so um is it is it because you like understanding that software or is it is it is, just is the it... fact that it exists <laughs> yeah now do you think it's something that exists sort of independent of our examination of it or is it is it yeah i think it yeah. is independent of our examination of it 
definitely um, the way it's perceived and the way it's described, of course, you know, is due to our you know, way of describing it. But, you know, I do think that it innately is there for sure. Now, something I, I asked earlier was, and it's a good question, um, is mathematics something that's discovered or is it something that's um, in a, a, an invention? Is it invented or discovered? So I would say that mathematical objects are invented. Like I think groups were invented, you know, in a certain sense. But all the facts about them and all the results about them and how they interact and everything about them is discovered. So the analogy I once made was that by inventing a mathematical object, like a topological space or whatever, you know, I could invent a mathematical object right now. It just might collapse and be trivial and have nothing interesting about it. But by inventing that object, we're kind of planting a seed. And the, so the tree that grows from that seed is the results about that mathematical object. And we, we don't have a, we don't play a part in shaping each branch of the tree. It just grows how it will. But that seed that we planted is our own invention and the results come from it as they will, and they are discovered. That makes sense. It does. I mean, I think you're kind of saying this both, <laughs> man. It's a little bit of Yeah, niche. yeah. I would say the, the objects are invented and the results about them are discovered. Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think that's a pretty good answer. I mean, it, it, it's a definitely a philosophical question one way or another. Yeah. Um, it's not even a mathematical question. It's a philosophical question of how you want to look at what would be a discovery as opposed to an invention. Um, the reason being is that other civilizations they're probably going to have similar type maths in some way. I mean, there's some just fundamental things are the same. That to me implies discovery more than invention, but. Uh... Yeah, that's, that's true. Well, and, and I just want to point out that, you know, I was the one who asked the question and then Steve just rephrased it and took credit for it. But that was, that was, of course, that's what I, 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 I do here. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do people want to see Nick? Do they want to see? He's actually on camera today. Let's, uh, let's actually show him. Um, why you guys yeah don't let that beautiful office go to waste no doubt right what the office what about the face <laughs> the face oh can't believe oh oh did you see the great books in the background oh, wow. Nick, could you move so we can see those books of yours thanks did you read thanks. anything have, have you read something no uh they're just there for show i mean i think if you open them they're they probably are real books but i haven't tried yeah, I, like I, I read a book once. Um, overrated. Yeah, it it, it it sucked. It's like, well, and you try talking to them, but they don't. They don't. You know, like you tell people these days. You try explaining to them back in back in the day, way back, almost prehistoric times. Um, they used to have these big buildings that were called libraries, um, and in them they had these weird things. They were called books. <laughs> And what you would do is you go to this this really ancient lady that would work there, uh, probably been in there for like 300 years, probably mystical of some kind. And she would kind of walk you over to this this catalog thing. You'd pull out these long trays that had these mystical cards in them. And then you would have to find what you're looking for. And it would give you this little number, this magical number. And you actually have to go look for it. Very bizarre system. Um yeah, but all that, the information had to actually be written down on a piece of paper that was like in your hand. You Can't open just... them up, and it was like, "Holy crap!" There's writing on these on these parchments. Well, and the, and the, and the uh, the sort of you know almost uh, monk esque uh, women who were or who were running these places always had a, a terrible attitude. <laughs> they really? Oh, they hated they almost, everybody. Yeah, they hated everybody. Yeah, they, they, it was sort of like they were there to help you and to make sure that you could access this information, which they treasured. But by nature of the fact that you were trying to access it, you were somehow really ruining their day. <laughs> and, and God forbid if you brought one of the books back late. Oh God! All hell. Oh, oh, there was yeah. There's a lot of ad attitude about that too. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I I, I rem I'm old enough to remember. Thank you for making me feel old. That's against, what I do. I, I'm here to bring everybody down. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> Just because, you know, you were not smart enough. We're not smart like John and good looking like John and, you know, muscular like John. Flex for this. Look at this. This guy's like a Adonis. He's smart oh, and an yeah, Adonis. I don't know about all that, you know? man. Girls fawning over him. Guys fawning over him. Look at that. Yeah, oh, my God. I'm not even He's kidding. Relative. He's like the perfect specimen oh, of male. Smart yeah. and physical. I hate him. I don't know why I get yeah. along with the dude. I have no idea why we're even <laughs> friends. I, I don't know. We're like well, diametrically we opposite. <laughs> It's probably because uh, you don't normally have to look at them. You that's can, true. You know. You're, uh, no, man, you're embarrassing me now. You got good genes, man. You got good genes. <laughs> now, you know, it's, it is true, though. Um, 
the the people that I find that are the coolest people are not so much you know the physical stuff, but the mental. And you have always been somebody that I've always respected because you know what the hell you're talking about. So whenever I had a math thing, you know, I knew. Yeah, that you I mean, were... if I don't, I just be quiet. That's, <laughs> That's kind of the way to, you, most of us should do it, right? You're not <laughs> sure of something. I'm definitely not one to uh, to you know if I don't know what I'm talking about, I I I don't pretend to, like I just. You know, I'll suspend my, my claims until, you know, I know what I'm talking about. Well, I got a question for you, so see if you know what you're talking about from Kawasa. Thank you, Kawasa. Super Chat, um, 5,000 yen, when, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's like five dollars. He says, if Euler was alive, would he be totally shunned in today's mathematical academia because he was Christian? No way. I mean, I, I no, I don't think so. In fact, I, I feel like mathematicians tend to be pretty uh, religious. Yeah, they don't probably don't care one way or another. I, I want to see. I don't know why that would have any effect on anything. Yeah, um, some absolutely. mathematicians are very religious. They see they see elegance in math, and they either the yeah. in the yeah, like Spinoza God tend to be you know less religious. But mathematicians, you know, they're in la la land for the most part. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I do think, you think a do you think a, a person has some kind of justification to say? That they look upon the mathematical elements of the world um, and the universe, such as like uh, Spinoza's God or the God of Philosophers, and go, "Yeah, this might actually be a real being." Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I can't remember who said it, but someone said that math is the language with which God wrote the universe. Someone said. Yeah, that. I never had an issue with that either. Um, I know a lot of people call that a fallacy of. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, well, it's it's basically an argument from beauty. It's not really a fallacy. Or argument yeah, for it's aesthetics. not a fallacy. It's not yeah. an argument at all, so it can't be a fallacy. It's just a claim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say it's really an argument either. I mean, I'd find it interesting that uh, there's some beauty and elegance in math. I'm not claiming that it, it it makes God right. So you're right. It really can't be a fallacy there. But I like Richard Dawkins. He thinks that the argument from elegance, again, not really an argument. Um, you know, is one of the weakest ones. And I happen to disagree. I think that if, if anything that I think that there might be something more out there, it's going to be because things are so elegant. Um, I, I find that to be fascinating. But that's just me, right? I mean, that's, everybody has their own ways of looking at things. But no, nobody's going to be persecuted because they're Christian in academia because there's a lot of Christians in academia. I mean, there's still right. a significant that's, portion. That's nonsense. That's not real life. I, I, I don't, I've never, I've never, ever heard of anyone being, you know, shunned in academia for a religious view. It's only if they make, you know, claims in the actual field that are a little nutty. But no, no one's gonna, you know, shun anyone for being. I don't religious. know why they would. I have no idea why that would even be a thing. I mean, yeah, it's not, we it's not people in science don't give a crap about your beliefs. What they care about yeah. is, you know, what's on the paper, what you yeah. can show, what you can demonstrate, what you can argue for. Um, a person could be a Satanist worshiping the devil and be a scientist as long as he, you know. It, it walks in that lab and he puts his lab coat on and everything else goes to the, the, the side because the best scientists I've ever heard, you know, known, they all say the same thing. When you go in the laboratory, your beliefs, religious beliefs go out the window for that time period. You're in the lab. You know, you don't you don't treat an experiment saying, hey, this experiment can be changed at any time because God could intervene and it, or the laws of logic or the laws of nature could stop working. You can't go in with an attitude like that. So even if you have the belief that God could do anything, you don't go into an experiment going, well, God could really screw me over if this is an experiment. No, <laughs> you're isolated at that point. And you, 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 that's what it makes a good scientist. That's why when I, I see people like um, these PhDs from Answers in Genesis or in Creations Institute of Research, uh, CRI or whatever the hell it is, Creations, Creationist Research um, Industries. What is it? CRI? Yeah, something like that, whatever. Right, uh, creationist Research Institute? Yeah, Creationist Research Institute. Then there's, then there's Creationist Ministries International. Um, yeah. But all the scientists that work for them, um, every one of them is not a scientist, in my opinion, any longer. They threw away their scientific credentials when they signed a paper that said that if we find evidence that goes against our beliefs, uh, that that evidence must be nullified. That must be wrong. That yeah, is that, not how you do science. Right. But but let me interject. If you want to get, if you want to win the Nobel Prize, it ain't that hard to do. Prove God. I mean, and there's nothing, there's no scientist who, if you could actually find a legitimate proof for a religious concept, who would say, well, because it's a religious concept, it doesn't count. Yeah. You know, again, science, science doesn't care. Uh, you know, they're, they're, what they care about is the results and the proof. So if you actually demonstrate and are capable of proving that something that we understand, including evolution, if you could, if you could disprove it successfully, disprove you'd be fam evolution, more famous than Einstein. 
yeah, you're going to get a Nobel Prize. You're going to. And the key is you just got to succeed at, at, at doing it via a, a scientific proof. Where do you get the Nobel Prize in there? Everybody says that. Then I looked it up and I was like, what? what the Nobel Prize doesn't have anything for that. Uh, there's Nobel Prizes in biology. There's one for biochemistry. Um, it's not biology. It's biochemistry. Well, it's not even it's not even the, it's not even for scientists. I don't think the Nobel Prize is the highest um, sort of uh, honor. I just use it because everybody. I know knows. for the mathematicians, the Fields Medal. I think it is right. Fields Medal, yeah, uh, yeah Wolf Prize. There, there's no Nobel Prize for math, but no, I agree. Like, I don't know where anyone gets this idea that science is anti-religious. Science just goes where it goes. Like, there are some people that think that the goal of science is to disprove religion. There are people on this planet <laughs> in this reality that think that. It's a little crazy. There are people on my Twitter feed who think <laughs> that. So, that's so good weird for me, though. As somebody who really does like science, when I hear that, it's discouraging. Because that's not the, the tent of science. Matter of fact, science came about through natural theology. And science came about yes. because scientists who were very religious at the time said, we need to find a method, methodological naturalism, where we can find natural explanations to natural phenomenon. They were, they were theists that, that developed a lot of this stuff. And so th there's a reason why science is the way it is. It wasn't to disprove theism. It was to say, look it, if God exists, he's going to do things through natural means, natural phenomenon. There has to be some natural explanations. And we want to find them if there are any. That's that was the goal. Um, well, that's a really so. good point. It it almost took God into in when the first um, scientists came out, uh, really born out of philosophy. They almost took God as an assumption. Yes. Because they didn't have any other grounding with which to start and make an assumption that the universe was going to be consistent. Descartes now did. We, look at dark, yeah. Look at Descartes in his in his rational approach to things. He he is, he basically assumed God existed, and that that was his basis for his ontology when he was. You know, being a critical thinker, it was it, to, to him. He couldn't even imagine there not being a god. So it wasn't like nowadays where we go, mm, "Does God exist or not?" That would have been unheard of in his time. So a lot of the scientists back then were very religious people, and plus, a lot of them got educations through the church. So yeah, I I, I think it's nonsensical to say that just because somebody's religion, they're going to be persecuted uh, in math or any other field. Nobody cares. It really, they really oh, don't. And that's the other, and I always pronounce it Lemaich, but it's, uh, how is it pronounced? Um, guy who invented the, uh, or discovered the Big Bang was uh, Lemaitre. Lemaitre. Oh, Lemaitre. Lemaitre, um, Belgian priest. No, and nobody cared. Nobody cared that uh, he was Catholic. No, and he explained it to Einstein. Einstein said, no, I don't believe you. This is not how, this is not how the universe works. This guy explained it to Einstein. Einstein gave him a standing ovation for once he, once Einstein got it. And this guy was a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. It, it, it does it doesn't work that way and that's why i lament people actually having sort of a basic understanding of just what's you don't you don't have to if you want to um sit here and poo poo science that's fine but at least understand what it's saying before you i i try to really understand bible verses and i i learn them from uh theologians i don't learn them from other atheists i go to a theologian and say what does this mean i usually find out it means very little relative to how i learned it from the atheist who usually straw mans it go to i yeah. i I learn the, the Bible verse, and then, uh, you know, I argue against it. You want to argue against uh, uh, science? Great, go ahead, do it. But at least know what a theory is. What at is, least what know is up the with base. straw man's a lot? I see straw man's daily uh, like that as well. You know, like oh, um, you know, like Big Bang seeks to disprove God. A straw man. Uh, a lot of people tell me that uh, you know what I put out a straw man. It's not. I mean, everything I put out is validatable, but. Uh, but I see people just for some reason they attack really silly arguments that nobody would even proffer as a proper <laughs> argument, and those are straw mans. That's literally what a straw man is. You're trying to to take an easier argument because you can't really attack the more difficult argument. And I see that to be one of the most used fallacies, uh, bar none, on many different platforms. Yeah, yeah. I think it's because I think that's a common fallacy because there's multiple ways that can contribute to someone making that fallacy. First, mm -hmm. they can just be ignorant of the actual argument. And second, they could be dishonest and being, know the actual argument, but on purpose, you know, setting up the straw man. So it can, it can definitely be like an innocent, ignorant type of fallacy, but it can also be one that's more nefarious, you know, actual dishonesty. Yeah, no, I, I think that most of them are unintentional, but when you start pointing out to them and we continue to do it, Oh, yeah, that's true. Then it's that's true. clearly intentional. Like, I have one person yeah. literally in, in their argument, they claimed, like they were explaining to someone, they said the Big Bang Theory states that lightning struck a mud puddle and that's oh, how <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. When do you go with somebody who is that inept? 
Yeah, that, that's just like you don't even care what it actually says. About. <laughs> that's like you don't even care to even try any longer. You yeah, just, yeah, you can't be trying. You, you're just not even trying at that point. I it was just the 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 sentence structure was just beautiful. It was like which states? <laughs> which states? Which states? As follows, hitherto. Well, it's the same thing with uh, arguments against evolution from um, uh, entropy. Uh, which, which you know, like okay, entropy states that you know the, the energy will always lean towards disorder. Uh, that's sort of what it states. They always leave out the in a closed system, uh -huh. yeah. which of course the Earth is not a closed system. Uh, and that that little tiny change, uh, all of a sudden, you're not going to have the debate if somebody actually knows what it actually. Well, I, said. I would even go certain further. I would say it's in an isolated system, not a closed system. Um, and there's only one true isolated system, which is the universe. Because the second yeah. law of thermodynamics really only deals with the fact that in any um, thermodynamic process, you're going to have inefficiencies. You're going to have a problem with the amount of theoretical. Uh, energy you can get out of the system as opposed to what you put in it's called a carnot efficiency for like an engine and so for any any operation any thermodynamical operation the net entropy of the universe must go up must go up always and so that's what the second law is really saying now there are ways of applying second law to non-isolated systems it's called multi-domain modeling where you kind of just break it down and you you take it in small segments then you kind of take an integral or integral of it but um you know, the, the people people that say that, that evolution is impossible by second law of thermodynamics, to me, like, as, as John said, they're not even trying at that point. They're just so wrong, they're not even wrong. Yeah, they're, they're looking for a way to justify their belief. Yes, yeah, so they've decided what they believe beforehand, and they're going out looking for, oh, entropy, that looks, okay, that fits. Here, here's some evidence that uh, that what I decided to believe is correct. Or, or they heard it from Ken Ham. I mean, listen, um, I, I, one of the great things about having you on here, um, and, and I think when we were talking about having, you know, theists on to discuss theological issues, no offense, you're not going to be brought on to discuss theology. Uh, you're going to be brought on to discuss mathematics, and that's why we, we have you on is because you're an expert and you're going to know. And then if we want to talk theology, we'll bring in theologians. We're not going to bring in scientists. But I think what you see a lot of the time, people who want to understand evolution go to Ken Ham. I mean, if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, not people isn't you know, anyone listening to this, but you understand what I'm saying, the, yeah. they'll ask another theologian, oh, how does um, evolution work? And I, there are so many people I've spoken to who got their evolution, their science knowledge from a priest. Like, I, that's, that's a, I understand why you want to take the shortcut and they speak your language. So they're going to explain it to you in a way that makes sense to you, but they're also going to explain it to you in a way that plays right into your biases because they've got the same bias. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it's a, a absolutely God awful, terrible way to do things. But you know, you're in a rush and you already believe what you believe. And you're not really looking to have it challenged. You're looking to challenge somebody else. So it's, it's God awful. Right. Yeah. It's like going, it's like going to a, uh, you know, a staunch a liberal and asking them what conservatives believe. Yeah. Oh, that, well, perfect. I mean, that perfect. Yeah. I, I I see. Like for example, Atheist Edge just had a little video on this with TJ and um, Courtney, and they were basically going through like twenty five questions that atheists can't answer, kind of thing, right? And every one of them, I thought, this has nothing to do with atheism. <laughs> what, what, what? Why would you ask an atheist? Well, you can't explain the Big Bang. So what? I know theists that can't explain the Big Bang. Big <laughs> deal. Or uh, you know, I, I I don't know how any of this the questions. Not knowing about science does not make or break your theological position, right? I mean, you could believe anything you want theologically and, and know a lot about science or know very little about science. But to say, oh, well, atheists can't answer this, that's a category error. It has nothing to do with atheist or non-belief or anything of the sort. So it really bugs me when I hear theists start asking questions like, well, an atheist can't explain morality. <laughs> no. Why did you say, why did you just say some people can't explain morality? Some people can't explain morality. Doesn't matter whether they're atheists or not. I can explain morality. Nick can explain morality. John, not I'm not sure, uh, but <laughs> I hear John in philosophy. I'm not quite sure where they, they they're. Are you a philosophical what? guy, John? You uh, read all my philosophical stuff when I, I, put I would on say YouTube I'm a, a layman for sure, but okay. no, I def I'm definitely interested. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the thing, though. If if I, as an atheist or anti-theist, try to answer those questions, uh, I, I, the first thing I will say is, look, you're not asking. This isn't an atheist issue, but since I'm an atheist or anti-theist and I'm answering those questions, all of a sudden it, it, there's no way for me to get involved without just playing right into that assumption. Yeah, well, that's but the problem. Um, aren't you playing into their assumption? Well, you just say, look, it, I, I, I'm going to talk about this, but there's nothing to do with my anti-theism or atheism, if that was the case. 
Well, that's what I try to do. And I think you're right, Steve. After a certain point, it's sort of like, you know, don't you understand that atheism is, is the denial that gods exist? That's it. A, a, an atheist doesn't necessarily believe in any other propositions other than that. Yes, there do, does tend to be a tendency towards leaning towards science, uh, or, you know, evolution and other, but it, it's not necessarily just because you're an atheist doesn't, you cannot assume any other thing. Um, but I wanted to give this example. Two Kings um, 223. Okay, this is a story where a, a bunch of boys are teasing a bald man and um, uh, God has them killed for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for teasing a bald man. Now, well, he was a prophet. I, um, well, and uh, well, and not only that, but the the uh, the language that they're using, if you understand the context, is actually a threat to kill him. So they're doing more than just teasing him. But if you just read the passage and you don't understand that background, you're going to be your people can sit there and say this is and i do have plenty of parts of the bible that i think you know have, are significantly morally questionable especially the old testament but uh you, you can look at this one this is one that i hear atheists give a lot and they say oh well um a bunch of boys murdered just for teasing someone well and uh you're right uh, i forget who the uh uh he was uh, he was the next in line for uh, as a as a prophet yeah he was the yeah, replacement I don't, I don't of, yeah it's it's been a while, but I, I see that one all the time where atheists say, but and I say, well, where did you hear that? And they say, well, we got it from another atheist or so on and so forth. Uh, one yeah. of my best friends is a uh, so I, I have an um, Anglican minister I talk to a lot, and one of my best friends is Greek Orthodox. So if I really have a question, I say, okay, what does this say? Because it looks really bad. Now I don't always agree, and I sometimes think that these are sort of post hoc. They're, they're taking bad parts of the Bible and saying, well, actually, we, we realized later that if you reinterpret it 16 different ways, it means something much nicer. I don't necessarily buy that, but at least I understand what the argument is, um, and I understand how they view it. So I don't go to, and as much as I'd even like to go to Sam Harris, if, if he'd, he'd take my phone call, he stopped calling. It was, it was a terrible thing. He won't take my calls anymore. But anyways, I'd like to talk to Sam Harris about it, uh, if I could. Uh, but I, 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 because he'd be predisposed to uh, my way of viewing it, uh, it's not a, it's not an honest broker situation. I got to talk to somebody who really believes it. Right. You you want to go to someone who it's in their best interest to convey the idea as accurately as possible. Yeah. 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 And uh, 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 but atheists, by the way, are at least as guilty of it. I I think. Well, maybe well, not. It's a least. human thing, you know. It is. It is. <laughs> It is so. It's it's just and it's a difficult thing. I I think I was gonna say atheists are at least as guilty of it. I'm not convinced that that's entirely true because I think atheists may value having uh, true beliefs a bit more than theists, and that may be one reason why they they tend towards uh, atheism. I, I I I you know what? I like to believe that, but you know as well as I do, I know a lot of atheists that I don't think they give a shit what's true or not because <laughs> I. I Look how much crap I get, right? I get people just telling me what an idiot I am. Um, I have this. I, I as you, I don't know if you watched it, but I um, did. You watch the video with Brittany and I, Nick? Yep. I didn't. Okay. I did not watch. Which video is this? Uh, Brittany uh, Simon uh, on her channel. We had about a, a ninety-minute video that we did. Um, no, link it, link it, or send me the um, thing, and I'll, right. I would look. But anyways, it um, you know, I even got most of the comments on there were really good uh, on her video. But really very nice comments but one person was just like steve's like the 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 philosopher seems like the philosophical version or the it's version of the jordan peterson or something like that and i was like what are you talking about they're like well you do word salad like jordan peterson i'm like well everything oh, i geez. say most people can understand um and they just did not even understand the fundamentals of the topic of atheism and i kept all they're doing was straw man to me and at this point i i was real polite to go look at um, I'm just not interested in this conversation. You were literally not at a level at I'm going to de degrade myself to have a conversation with. Um, and you have to any longer. You reach a point where you just don't have the time. When somebody doesn't oh, no, have, no. When, it, like, for example, uh, John, being in the math, if somebody's telling you that you're fundamentally wrong on math or something, you know, and we use point nine, I'm repeating a lot, because that is something difficult to conceptualize for some people. But if you ask them and you say, well, what, what is your mathematical background? They tell you, oh, I, I've never had a math course. Math sucks, but I'm an expert on this and you're not because I, you know, <laughs> I, I watched a video on this and, uh, you know, a video told me that is, you know, not true. Can you see the frustration for that? I mean, eventually you just have to say to that person, look, I'm gonna, I can yeah. try to explain to you if you don't want to listen. I'm done. I'm going to go to happier pastures with somebody else where they might be able to understand because I, I just can't do it. If 
if someone comes to me with a you know terrible argument and then i'll ask okay what is your background but like if someone comes up to me and they give me a reasonable argument about something, you know, even mathematically, they have no background whatsoever, but their argument makes sense. I don't even bring up background. Well, no, and, and I know, and, and I agree with you 100 percent on that. Yeah, but I'm like, saying if somebody, if somebody is telling you, like for example, like all evolution is wrong, they think you're an right. idiot for evolution. And then you ask them, well, what do you know about evolution? Oh, I've never taken a course in evolution in my life. Right, okay, it's then, done in Kruger. Yeah, it's DK. So. so, but I can tell you right now, like every time I've been wrong in math, the truth was always way cooler than what I initially thought. <laughs> So it was always something that made me happy. Well, the the only thing I want to disagree with you on, Steve, is yeah, Steve, Steve, I love how he does this. He's just like, oh well, I say it in ways that everyone can understand. No, I don't always necessarily agree with that. Uh, fair I think, enough. I try to say it in ways that I think most people can understand. The majority of people, if they bother to, well, it's not I word salad. That's, that's for sure. I mean, I don't. No, it's not. I don't no, say things that are dis, dis asininely stupid or word salad. I mean, if if I'm sure John started speaking math right now, most people are going, "What the hell is that nonsense?" But it would make sense to him, and maybe some of the words I would get. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's word salad. Oh no, it do, it doesn't at all. I, I I think what they think you're doing is you know you're trying to use concepts that are are above their heads, and some of them are real basic, simple stuff. I mean, when you start using formal logic and the um the semantics of it, you know, p or um uh, p or uh, you know, I'm, I'm you're not tired. p. <laughs> that is the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, people sit there and say that because they don't uh, they can't read um uh formal notation. They sit there and say, well, he must be giving it because he knows I can't read it. And therefore, you know, I can't actually disprove. He says it proves it, but I can't I can't read these letters here. So I yeah. think I think there's some of that. See, That's obviously not your fault. So, but. Somebody said if they don't understand this word salad. No, I disagree. No, no. Word salad is when it's unintelligible that nobody can look at that and say this has any meaning to it. That's word salad to me. Just because you don't understand it's not word salad. It, it, it may be in your own isolated view. But I, I don't call that. I, don't, I subscribe yeah, as well as, to the principle as as that word salad is. You know, obscuring of something so that people just back off and say, "Okay, I guess I'll just accept what he's saying." Yeah, yeah. That's well. That's that's it. It's the um, it's the Deepak Chopra when he throws out three thousand yeah. words and they sound like they're strung together beautifully. But if you were to actually try to break apart that sentence, you'd realize he has no idea what. Yeah, he's so talking uh, Lucifer about. Almighty said, "Yeah, Trey Jadlow is perfect at word salad." If you ever sat down and tried figuring out what the hell Trey Jadlow is trying to say, good luck with that. No, uh, <laughs> Baudrillard, who philosopher, pretty modern philosopher, uh, simu sim simulacra or so I don't know, but I know what a simulacra is. That's like a, a, something in the Jewish mythos Jean, that was very. That was like Jean, a, Jean Baudrillard. It's B A U D R I L L I A R D. But so anyway, an image philosopher. Yeah. His his sentences. It got to be that he's just like throwing darts at a board or something like that. <laughs> I just like, use these words, yeah. It's kind of like when you're, you're developing something you want to like anyway. scam people with. You just use words like quantum a lot and ionized <laughs> and uh, holistic, yeah. Yeah, Deep, Deepak Chopra, I think, is one of the best at it. And his debate with Sam Harris, Sam Harris just wasn't having any of it. Was was That was a great way to well, shut it Well, there's always down. a Mr. Intelligent Design. I mean, he's he's just... Brilliant, isn't he? I mean, he's got six books out that he wrote that five people bought. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I listened to this challenge design, and you were just being going, "What the hell is he saying?" That's word salad. Um, yeah. All right, but anyways, um, I, I don't want this to go too long. I know John, you got things to do. We could do this obviously again. This was kind of a pilot thing, so couldn't get too much out. But uh, you know, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that uh, people. Well, start calling in on these things. Ask a mathematician, ask a physicist, ask a... I mean, I have a lot of different things on, so uh, come join us for these things. But uh, Non Sequitur Show is going to be starting up soon, so go watch the Flat Earth Fight if you want on Saturday. I, however, I'm going to order Domino's, and I'm going to uh, basically watch TV, um, catch up on TV tonight over some, some pizza. Sound good? Good. All right. All right. So, Nick, funny. thanks for joining us. Uh, John, please tell people your channel and anything else you want them to know about you. Yeah, my channel is Epic Math Time. It's epic, and it's about math. Please go check it out. It's a lot of fun. I do different problems, you know, random stuff that I think is interesting. Do basically, whatever I want to do, that's what happens. But, yeah, go check it out. Epic Math. Is that a tautology? It's epic, and it's math. It's a epic math. Yeah, it it's is. epic, and it's math. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really good, guys. Um, 
he has a way of explaining things to 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 people that if you're not really hip on math, you you hopefully get it. And it's not a beginners either. It's not advanced. It's not beginners. I think you're kind of like in the mid, and I kind of like that. I mean, yeah, yeah. so you're not like you're taking it down to the grassroots, but you assume people know a little bit. But you're not so high and mighty that people are going, "What the hell he's doing?" You break it down each step. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying like to. That. I'm still learning how to gauge that. But yeah, yeah I think that's a good uh, description of what I want to be like. Yeah. Awesome. Well, go check it out. Link is in the video description. And thank you guys for watching and have a good night.